Good morning, church. Let's stand and sing, Sing and Be Happy, number 841. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and sin, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust him who thee to he will keep your soul let all be faithful look to him and pray lift your voice and praise him song sing and be happy today often we are troubled and tired sick with sorrow and pain there are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take no courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart surely can sing. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust Him. Who feeds you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust Him. Who feeds you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him so. Sing and be happy today. Be seated, please. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing the Old Rugged Cross. Number 645 in your book. <clears throat> mm -hmm. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old Till my trophies at last I lay down, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old. Rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to Till my trophies at last I 
Saying, uh, read from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walks not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this time we have to assemble, to approach thy throne of grace, and to remember your Son's sacrifice for us, for our sins. We pray that we may partake of this loaf, which represents his broken body, in a pleasing manner. Forgive us our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this fruit of the vine, and we thank you that for what it represents, your Son on the cross, shedding his blood for our sins, Father. Help us to reflect on him as we partake of this. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. now have opportunity to give back what the Lord has provided for us. And there's an example of this for the early church in 1 Corinthians. I'd like to read starting in verse, chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the children of, the, of, Galatia, of Galatia, so you also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store up that he may prosper what he's prospered so that there may be no collection when I come. <clears throat> As was mentioned earlier about the hurricane, we have a lot of a lot of needs in the world. We have also want to help spread the gospel, so we want to try to remember that as we give back. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for everything you give us, and thank you for this building that you bless us with, and we can come here to worship you and the Lord, learn more about you. Please help us to give back cheerfully, and most of all, thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Restore my spirit, Lord, my need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, renew my faith, Lord, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, your zeal from God. Renew my love, renew my faith, Lord, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, in these restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew 
rebuild my love, rebuild my faith, come restore my soul. If you're using a songbook this morning, the song of imitation um, will be Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary, and that uh, is number 95. And before Brother Matt's lesson, let's stand and sing I'll Fly Away, number 824. <clears throat> Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Oh, when the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Oh, I wake up there from prison bars as full, I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. coming from Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 11. Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 11. What is more, I consider myself everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that it which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the bias of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, become like him in death, and so somehow attaining to resurrection from the dead. Got a lot of great things going on. I think the uh, uh, church is really experiencing some amazing things here. I hope you are excited about the uh, the class rotation that Donnie is working on, to, to, and I hope the ladies will be involved in that to help make that easier and help that uh, to go smoothly. I, I hope you're excited about the leadership classes for the men that we're going to have in October on Sunday evenings, and hope you take a part of that. Uh, I'm excited about the potluck that we're having with the other church today. I'm excited about the, the building project that's doing great and the men who are working hard to, to, to make that go smoothly and, and to help that get done. A lot of great things going on here with this congregation. Uh, I think God is really working here and I am so thankful uh, to be a part of it. And I'm thankful that you're here to be a part of it, to experience this growth and to, and to help us to be a light in this community. And I just am 
am thankful for everything that's, that's going on here and excited about it, and I hope that you are too. Many of us are very familiar with Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. We know this verse. We've heard this verse. We've read this verse. We've heard sermons on this verse, had Bible classes on this verse. We are very aware that this verse is in the Bible and that it says that someone can, in fact, fall away from the grace of God. Someone can be in Christ and then severed from Christ, cut off from Christ. And it doesn't matter what you say about this verse. It doesn't matter how you try to twist it or from what angle you approach it. It's just very clear that someone can be in God's grace and then fall from it. But in my haste to make that point to those who need to hear it, I've often overlooked who it actually says will be severed from Christ. Who it actually says has fallen from grace. Because it's actually someone who, to me, is quite surprising. In the past, when I've read this verse, and, and as I've talked to others about it, what I had pictured in my mind was someone who's disobedient to God. Someone who doesn't care about God. Someone who, even though he or she had been in Christ, they have now rebelled and they, are no, they no longer care about God's will. Someone who's become a hypocrite. Or someone who pursues all manner of sin and gets involved in immorality and lying and stealing and all kinds of things. But that's not who it is. Look again at who it says has fallen from grace and has been severed from Christ. It's not immoral, rebellious hypocrites. It's those who would be justified by law. These aren't people who don't care about God's law, though I have no doubt that those who uh, come to a point of rebellion and don't care about God's law would find themselves in the same position. But it's people who care very much about the law of God. In fact, they care so much about the law of God that they believe that they will be justified, declared innocent by the law of God. Now, granted, I understand that in Galatians, Paul is talking about the law of the old covenant, and we'll deal with that in a few minutes, and, and we'll recognize where that fits in uh, into our discussion. But I want us to recognize that these are not immoral, rebellious hypocrites. He's talking about people who care very much about living by God's law, and yet they have fallen from grace. They have been severed from Christ. And to me, this is very shocking. Now, when we talk about standing firm in the midst of God's grace, there are some principles here that we need to understand. Over the last few weeks, we've learned that we need to recognize that we have a need for God's grace. We need God's grace. We've learned that we need to listen to God's word. And we've learned that we need to hope fully in God's grace. And what we learn from Paul's teaching here in Galatians is that if we want to stand firm in the midst of God's grace, we need to learn that we must live by faith and not by law. Now please hang with me because... I know that what some of you think you just heard was all you have to do is believe in Jesus and it doesn't matter, matter whether or not you obey God. But that is not what I'm saying. And I hope that you can hang with me as we walk through what the scripture says to understand what it means to live by faith 
and not by law. So that we can stand firm in the midst of the grace of God that will save us and allow us to be with him for all eternity. Now as we consider this idea, I think there's a passage in scripture that will help us understand the principles that we need to grasp. And, and uh, they're in Romans chapter 9 verse 30 through Romans chapter 10 and verse Romans 9 and verse 30 through Romans 10 and verse 4. We're going to jump through that chapter break because I think these sections go together. It says, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written. Behold, I am laying, a stone, a Zi- I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not, put to, he, uh, will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, the very first thing that Paul demonstrates to us in this passage is that pursuing law will not lead to righteousness. And that's shocking. That is what the Jews thought. The Jews thought that if they were going to be righteous, they needed to pursue the law. But what does this passage point out? This passage points out that they pursued the law, but they did not gain righteousness. They didn't gain righteousness because they did not succeed in achieving the law. And that's the problem that we need to grasp. Sometimes I think we look back at how Paul viewed his Jewish friends and brethren and we get uh, we get a lopsided view of what Paul thought. I think sometimes as we read Romans, we think that what Paul is telling us is that all of his Jewish friends and brethren were just a bunch of wicked, awful Hypocrites who claimed they loved the law, but really they were they were just abandoning it. They were rebelling against it. But that's not the case. Look in Romans chapter two and verse 17. In Romans two and verse 17. Paul says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. We often look at this passage and we think that Paul was saying, look at these wicked, awful, hypocritical Jews who who teach the law, but they're also just consistently, constantly breaking it because they don't really care about it. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul talks about people who approve what's excellent, who pursue what's excellent, who believe what is excellent. They think that they're teachers and lights to the blind because they love God's law and they're striving to keep God's law. However, they have a problem. What's the problem? They can't keep God's law perfectly. They haven't kept God's law perfectly. These are not wicked, rebellious hypocrites. They're people just like us who say God has a law. God has a law and they love it and they, and they teach it, but they keep breaking it. Let me ask you, do you teach 
that lying is wrong? Do you teach that lying is wrong? Okay, now have you ever lied? So could Paul then say to you, you who teach against lying, do you lie? And would he necessarily mean that you are evil, wicked, awful hypocrites? Or would he just be highlighting the fact that we know what God's law says and yet we have violated it. We have broken it. That's what he's talking about. In fact, in our passage in Romans 10, he talks about these Jews and he bears them witness that they have a zeal for God. He's not talking about a bunch of wicked, awful hypocrites. He's talking about people who love the law of God, who want to keep the law of God. But as they've taught it and they've boasted in it, they, they've come smack up against the problem that they continue to break it. Just like we do. And this presents a problem. Back in Romans 2 and verse 12. In Romans 2 and verse 12, it says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. What problem do these people find themselves facing? The problem they find themselves, fa themselves facing is that just having the law and believing the law and knowing the law and trying really hard to keep the law doesn't justify because if you sin under the law, you'll be judged by the law. And if you sin without the law, you'll perish without the law. So, where does that leave all of us? Destined for death and perishing. James 2 and verse 10. James 2 and verse 10 demonstrates why this is such a tragic thing. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. If we keep the entire law except for one point, we're accountable and guilty for every point. All of it. And this is what God demonstrated under that old covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 26, Deuteronomy 27 and verse 26, God said, cursed be anyone who does not confirm the, the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, amen. Now I have to, having read that, I do need to take one little break here and, and just explain something. I want to make sure that everyone is clear when I say law in this lesson, I'm not using it as a shorthand for the entire covenant. I'm talking about the legal stipulations. I know that we have a tendency to refer to that old covenant as the old law and the new covenant as the new law, but that's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about the legal stipulations of the covenant. And that's what Moses is saying here. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say amen. If I don't confirm it by doing every single bit of it, I'm cursed. And then in chapter 28, in verse 15, it says... But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I commanded you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. How many of the commandments did they have to do to keep from having the curses? All of them. If they kept 99 and just missed one, the curses would come upon them. Paul expounds on this in Galatians 3 and verse 10. Galatians 3 and verse 10, referring back to these very statements. In Galatians 3 and verse 10, Paul reminds us of what Moses had said. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. 
Where does the curse come from? It comes from not doing every single one of the laws. And so, where does that leave us? That leaves us where we started a few weeks ago. Romans 3 and verse 10. Romans 3 and verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And remember a few weeks ago, we pointed out that we're not sinners when we're this bad. We're this bad when we've sinned. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, All have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's the problem. That's the problem. So what are we going to do about that? I'll tell you what so many do today. When they realize, I'm a sinner, I've sinned, I've fallen short of the glory of God. Often what they think will justify them is their ability to keep a set of rules. To keep a law. If I can just prove to God that I really can keep your laws, I can do it. Just watch God. You know, I don't need your forgiveness. I just need your patience. I need you to be patient with me. And you'll see I really can do it. And then you'll know that I'm able to go to heaven or I deserve to go to heaven. But that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Look back in Romans chapter 2 and verse 25. Romans chapter 2 and verse 25. It doesn't work for two reasons. First is the principle we see in Romans 2 and verse 25. For circumcision indeed is the value uh, if, it, I'm sorry, <clears throat> for circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. The principle that we find from this is keeping one law doesn't make up for breaking another law. And even if I'm able to keep every single one of God's laws perfectly from today on, that still, it, it, that doesn't make up for the fact that I've already violated his law. I can't justify myself by starting today and keeping, keeping, all, keeping God's law perfect from here on out even. It, it just won't happen. But there's a second problem. And that's what we notice in Romans chapter 7. Not only will keeping one law today not make up for breaking a law yesterday, what Romans 7 says is, if I'm planning to bring to God my ability to keep his law all by myself, it'll never happen. Now, I'm not saying that, that we won't improve. I'm not saying that we won't get better. I'm just saying that it's not going to happen completely. It's not going to happen perfectly. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. Romans 7 and verse 14. Paul talked about that. For we know that the law is spiritual. But, uh, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want. I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law. That, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. 
Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is Paul telling us, this is what it's like to try and rely on your own strength and your own ability. He said, I tried that and it didn't work. He said, what I found is that no matter how much I loved the law of God and wanted to keep the law of God, it was as if there was another law in my members governing me. And sin lies close at hand. Here's the reality, brothers and sisters. If what we want to do is bring to God our ability to keep the law, the law is going to do one thing and one thing only. It's going to declare us guilty. It's going to declare us guilty because we haven't kept it perfectly. That's all it can do. It can't justify us. It can't save us. All it can do is declare us guilty because we are. And so we find throughout Scripture again and again the statement that we can't be justified by law. Romans 3 and verse 20. Romans 3 and verse 20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Galatians 2 and verse 16. Galatians 2 and verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. And at the end of that same verse, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Galatians 3 and verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. And then in Galatians 5 and verse 4. Galatians 5 and verse 4, which we already read. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. And finally, Hebrews 7 and verse 18. Hebrews 7, 18. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and its, use, its uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. And the law isn't intended to make us perfect perfect god didn't give the law in order to justify people because law can't justify people all law can do is show us where we fail all law can do is show us where we're guilty and if we come to god and we bring his law and say look at how well i did i should get to go to heaven he's going to say yeah but what about this one do you remember do you remember do you remember this one Oh yeah, well I was kind of hoping maybe he would have overlooked that one. And what about this one? And what about that one? And, and I, in fact, I think most of us would have to admit that we'd be, we'd be guilty more than just on one or two infractions here. And so, as Romans 3 and verse 20 said, we will not be justified by the law. It just can't happen. And so, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 8, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 8, we learn that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whoever else is, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The law was given to show those those who have broken the law, that they're guilty, that they're sinners, that they've died. Back in Romans chapter 7, back in Romans chapter 7, which we read a moment ago, just, just a few verses before that, listen to what Paul says that the law did for him. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if, I had not, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. 
But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. He said, sin takes the law, twists it, produces this desire, and kills us. That's what law does. It kills and condemns. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56, Paul said, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Death, like a scorpion, has a sting. And that sting is sin. But what gives that sin power? The law. Now even though it gets ahead, you may already be thinking about the contrast with Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans 1 and verse 16 that says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation and life. You see, the law is the power of sin for death. But the gospel of Jesus is the power of God for salvation and life. And so in Romans chapter 9, in verse 31, Romans 9 and verse 31, Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. And so what did they not get? They did not get righteousness. And this is what we just have to understand. Pursuing law will not lead to righteousness. But Matt, all of those passages are dealing with the law of Moses. Those passages aren't dealing with our law. And that's true. Just about every single one of those passages that I've read is a reference to the law of Moses. I understand that. And we need to recognize that there is a different law. Hebrews 7 points out that with a change of priesthood, there's also a change of law. But the reason we bring this up is because we're so afraid that when someone says we don't have to live by law, when someone says we can't be justified by law, immediately what we begin to fear is that that person is saying we don't have to obey God. We don't have to do God's will. His will doesn't matter. And I am not saying that. The reality is sin is the violation of God's law. Romans 5 and verse 13 says sin is not counted where there is no law. I want you to recognize what that means. If God's law doesn't matter, then there is no sin. And if there is no sin then we don't need God's grace. The mere fact that we're pointing out that we desperately, absolutely need God's grace is not a claim that God's law doesn't matter, but a claim that it absolutely matters. The problem is we've broken it. We've broken it and that matters. And we long to keep it, but we continue to fail, and that matters. But the object, the, the objection for that, uh, the, the objection that he's, uh, uh, that he's dealing with the law of Moses and not our law is also answered, I believe, in Romans chapters 9 and 10, where Paul, where, where, where Paul's not saying that this is just a matter of uh, they weren't keeping the old law, so now God gave them a new set of rules. If you keep this new set of rules, that'll get you there. That, that, that's not what he's saying. He's pointing out that God had been using the law of Moses as an object lesson that's supposed to help us understand something. And that is that a list of rules and regulations cannot justify us. Law cannot justify us. We need something else. Notice what he says in Romans chapter 10. Look in Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them 
is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For by, for by, for, for be, being ignorant, I'm sorry, I'm messing this thing up now. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the new set of rules of God, they haven't been following this new set of rules. They're still following the old set of rules. Is that what yours says? No, it's not what mine says either. It's like, what version is that? This is an illustration. And listen to what he says. For real, this is what he says. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, this is an object lesson that we're supposed to understand. And that's, that's our second principle. Establishing our own righteousness doesn't work. Establishing our own righteousness doesn't work. If, if we just take the law of Christ's new covenant and try to use it as a means of establishing and demonstrating our own personal righteousness because of how good we've kept the rules and regulations, we're just going to take that law to God and he's going to say, yeah, but what about this one? And what about that one? And we're going to be guilty. You see, the point of the old law wasn't, here's a set of rules that won't work, but one of these days I'm going to give you a set of rules that will work. The point of God's of, of that old law was, if all we're going to do is take a set of rules to God, all he's going to see is where we have broken it and violated it. And we'll be guilty. And we'll be condemned. Establishing our own righteousness will not work. These Jews were like the ones that Jesus highlighted in Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Uh, this is where he's telling the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18 and verse 9. And it says, he also told this parable of, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. I fear that too often in my life, I've trusted in myself that I'm righteous. Because look at all these good things that I do. and Look at how well I've kept the law here and I don't do this and you know, I don't do that. And, and I'm certainly better than all those people out there who, who don't care about God's will. So, you know, I deserve to go to heaven. But it just doesn't work that way. If what I'm going to do is take the legal stipulations to God and say, look, I deserve to be justified. All the legal stipulations are going to show us is, no, I deserve condemnation. I deserve to be condemned. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3 and verse 21. Galatians 3 and verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. What Paul's saying, what is he saying? He's saying, in this verse, he's saying, look, the issue is not, here's a law that wouldn't work, and now you're waiting for a new law that will work. His point is, if law could do it, if living by law could get you right to righteousness, then that one would have worked. That one would have done it. The whole point of giving that one was to demonstrate to us that that doesn't work. You've already blown your own righteousness. And you won't be able to establish it by keeping more rules from now on. It's just... That's not going to work. And I have to tell you that this, is, this completely blows apart the, the ideas of grace that I've had in the past. I mean, for years I've said, yes, we're saved by grace. But here was, was the image that I had in my mind. 
in my mind, what I was supposed to do was establish my own righteousness. I, I was supposed to demonstrate to God, look at how good I am. God, I love you and I'll prove it. Look, look at how good I am. I, I've kept this rule. I, I've kept that rule. I haven't broke this rule. And I know I broke that one once, but I haven't been doing it anymore since then, remember? So, in my mind... I was supposed to do my absolute dead level best to justify myself by perfectly keeping God's law. Now, here's what I knew. I knew, of course, that I couldn't do it perfectly. But, you know, maybe I could do it good enough. Because in my mind, it was as if God was giving grace on the curve. He had some line that if you got this number of doctrines right and you, got, and you did this number of things right, then everybody who got above that was going to get the grace that would nudge them on the rest of the way. But everybody who, who was below that, well, it's just too bad. And I want you to understand what that is. That's me trying to establish my own righteousness and that just doesn't work the reality is your righteousness is not good enough and it never will be and if what you hope to do is establish your own righteousness and bring it to God and that's the reason you're going to get into heaven it's going to fail because establishing our own righteousness just doesn't work. So what are we going to do? Where does that leave us? Well, Paul's shocking answer is to turn to the very people who we would think would be the last people that we would turn to. He says we need to consider the Gentiles. Look back in Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. Romans 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I am laying in, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He says the Jews pursued a law that they thought would gain them righteousness. But they didn't gain the law, so they didn't gain righteousness. And the Gentiles... Weren't even, weren't even pursuing righteousness, but they pursued faith. And what did they get? They got righteousness. So, what do we learn? We've got to seek God's righteousness by faith. You see, the Jews stumbled over a stumbling stone. They couldn't fathom that righteousness would come to them in any other way other than their supreme ability to keep God's law better than everybody else. And I fear that sometimes I've made that exact same mistake and stumbled over that exact same mistake stumbling stone but what he says is righteousness comes by faith paul talks about this in philippians 3 and verse 8 philippians 3 and verse 8 indeed i count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake i have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that i may gain christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in christ the righteousness from god that depends on faith that i may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering becoming like him 
in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I want you to think about Paul. Paul was the person who back in verse 6 said that according to the law and, and righteousness under the law, according to that, he was blameless. There was nobody that could, that could point a finger at Paul except God, of course. God knew where he had violated the law. But when it came to the people around him, as far as they could see, this man was blameless. They couldn't take him to a court of law and say, look what Paul has done. He deserves death. They couldn't do that. But Paul understood that's not good enough. That's not good enough because God knows where I violated the law. And so he said, I'm no longer trying to have that righteousness that comes from law. I need the righteousness that comes from faith in Jesus Christ. And did you see the kind of life that he led because of that? He didn't say, oh, that means I don't have to worry about God's will. That's not what he said. That's not what he did. He gave up so many things. He cut off so many things because more than anything else, he wanted to be in Christ so that he could have the righteousness that comes by faith in God. And so it shouldn't surprise us that as many times as the scripture says, we're not going to be justified by law. It does say that we're justified by faith. For instance, in Galatians 2 and verse 16. Galatians 2 and verse 16, it says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law. We read that part earlier. But through faith in Jesus Christ, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. In Galatians 3 and verse 11, Galatians 3.11, it says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by, by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. It's faith that provides justification. Galatians 3 and verse 24. Galatians 3 and verse 24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. If we want justification, if we want righteousness, we've got to seek the righteousness that comes from God by faith. There is no other way. So what does that mean? Does that mean, as some have erroneously taught, that living by faith means that it doesn't matter how I live just as long as I believe Jesus died on the cross? That's not what it meant to Paul. That's not what it meant to Paul at all. You see, what Paul talked about, when he talked about having faith, he said, we need to live by faith and not by law. The old covenant said the righteous shall live by faith. And three times uh, uh, that, that's quoted in the New Testament scripture. Romans 1 verse 16 and 17. I'm sorry, I'm getting all uh, talking over myself. Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. Galatians 3 and verse 11. And Hebrews 10 and verse 38. The righteous shall live by faith. Do you recognize the dual meaning of this passage? First, it says that the righteous shall live by faith. That is, the life of the righteous shall be governed by faith. The standard of their life is faith. But also, the righteous shall live by faith. That is, that it's through faith that the righteous will have life. You see what Paul is saying here in this one statement? He says that by faith you will live if you live by faith. By faith you will live if you live by faith. And what does that look like? Does living by faith, uh, does it look like rebelling against God's law? Is that what it looks like? Thinking that it doesn't matter, Jesus died so I could just keep on sinning? Is that what it looks like? No, that's not what it looks like at all. Look in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. 
Galatians 2 and verse 20 there. There Paul uh, describes living by faith. In Galatians 2 and verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now does that sound like I don't care about God's law? I'm saved by grace? No. But I'll tell you what, there is a difference in, in motivation. Because, you see, living by law says, hey God, look at, look at me, look at how well I've kept your rules. Living by faith says, God, I'm sorry I've blown it. Please take over. Do you see the difference? If we want to stand firm in God's grace... We've got to live by faith. Because desperately trying to take the law to God and saying, look at how well I've kept it, isn't going to work. I'm just trying to think about it on a practical level. Thinking about us here this morning why are you here this morning is it to prove to God how great you are at keeping laws hoping to impress God with your attendance or are you here because you're impressed by God and his righteousness why are you here if you're here hoping that you'll get enough attendance points to get you into heaven, then I'm going to tell you that that's just not, that's just not going to work. But if you're here because you realize that you're a desperate sinner and you need God's grace and you'll cut out anything and, and everything to pursue being in that because you believe it and you're amazed by it. If that's the case, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So why are you here this morning? If you'd like to, you can go ahead and pull your Bibles and your or put your Bibles and your notes away. So we get ready to sing our invitation song here in just a moment. Sorry, I know I ran a little long this morning. But I figured since the other group wasn't going to get here until around noon, we had till noon, right? So, I uh, didn't. I didn't go that long. But. <clears throat> Today, I want you to understand that even though you're not good enough on your own, you are good enough with Jesus. If you have Jesus and you're living by faith in Jesus, He'll justify you. And Jesus said. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. If you want to be saved, you need to be in Jesus, and he'll save you. If we can help you with that this morning, you let us know by coming to the front as we stand together and sing. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and weary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very dear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, and Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burns are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burns are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, 
the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burns are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burns are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burns are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Close today with when all of God's singers get home, number eight thirty nine. What a song of delight in that city so bright! We'll be rocked into heaven's fair dome. How the ransom will raise happy songs to His praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home. Whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. As we sing here on earth, songs of sadness or mirth, tis a foretaste of rapture to come. But our joy can't compare with the glory up there when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Never overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foam. Every heart will be light, and each face will be bright, when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to be able to come together, worship and praise you. Lord, we thank you so much for Brother Matt and his lesson. We ask that you take, have us take that lesson and apply it to our Christian walk each and every day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had here to gather. We thank you for the opportunity we have now to gather with the Marshfield Church of Christ. We ask that you bless that, Lord. Lord, as we depart from here today, we ask that you give us safe travels and be with us until we meet again. Lord, we ask that you be with all those that are sick and those uh, all that are traveling. Lord, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice, and it's through his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.